as we recognize this uh, design that God has for us, that gives us homework. That gives us a direction in the Word every day. That we're not just getting in the Word to, to uh, clock time. Like, okay, God, I gave you 15 minutes today. I clocked in and I clocked out, and you can just look at the time clock and see I was there. You know, we're not just trying to get in and, 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 and get time, but we're there because we are preparing, building our house. Like we saw this morning, Jesus said, the man who hears my sayings and does my sayings is a man who's building his house. And he's building his house by digging deep and laying his life upon the foundation of truth, upon the stronghold of the word of God. Matthew chapter 6, and we're still recognizing a contrast of how we can build a stronghold, a correct stronghold of the word, a stronghold of health, a stronghold of peace, a stronghold of, of whatever it is, uh, righteousness, I think, is one of the most important strongholds because if we have that in place, it allows us an uh, access to many other areas. But when we see uh, in Mark, or Matthew, did I say Mark? Matthew 6, I turned to Mark. I want you in Matthew 6. When we see in Matthew 6, Jesus is teaching and, and warning them about the wrong stronghold again. He says here in Matthew 6, I want to look uh, first at verse 25. He said, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. And the Amplified helps us identify what kind of thoughts he's uh, uh, referring to. He said, take no anxious thought for your life. Take no anxious, worried, fretful thought for your life. And so... This is a trick that Jesus has dealt with before because when he was teaching about the parable of the sower, he said that worry is a thorn that chokes out the word. He said the cares of this life in the King James, the cares of this life choke out the word. So he's telling us now that we've got to guard against this worry and this is how we do it, by refusing certain thoughts. He said, take no thought for your life. Don't take that thought. You are the one authorized to accept it or refuse it. There are thoughts that you are not supposed to accept. And as we become more uh, aware of who we are in Christ and what belongs to us as believers, we recognize that we are not authorized, not any day of the week, are we authorized to carry care? And if we, get, if we get patted down, if God does a search and he walks in and says, we're going to do a search today and find out, is there any care in your heart? You don't want to be caught with contraband. You don't want to be caught with care. And so you better just go ahead and cast it when you recognize that you've accepted it into your life. Don't take it. But if you have taken it, go ahead and cast it out. Get rid of that care. But he said there are thoughts you are authorized to resist. Take no thought for your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, yet for your body, what you will put on. And then he redirects the attention to an example. Look at the fowls of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, and they still have an abundant supply. Look at that instead. Think about supply. Don't look at what you are going to need. Look at how I supply. Do you see? He is redirecting their thought process. And then he uses the example of the lilies of the field. And I like this. This is one of my favorite examples because that means new wardrobe every season. <laughs> hey! That's what I'm talking about. Springtime's coming. I'm going to need a new wardrobe this spring. He said, look at how God provides and cares for the lilies that even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. And aren't you much better than they? Amen? And so he redirects their thought. He tells them there are thoughts they should not take that they should resist those thoughts. And then 
as a response to the wrong thought that was presented, I need to put my mind on the right thing. That's my job. That's your job. We are responsible to uh, police the thoughts that we're allowing in our heart and in our mind. Because if it gets in my mind, it's going to, if, if, how did he say, if I can get you to meditate on it and then I get you to speak it, what's going to happen? You're going to walk in line with it. You're going to live it out and you'll prosper if it's God's word that you are thinking about and speaking. If it's God's word, you'll prosper. But if it's not, if it's not God's word that's in your mind and in your mouth, and you're thinking about something that came from the adversary, something that came from the world system, something that came that doesn't, it's not based on truth, it's not based on light, it's based on fear, or it's based on worry, or it's based on lack, or it's based on, on hate, or whatever. If it's not God's word, and it's getting into this, this engine that's designed to make you overcome, the engine of God being the heart of man is designed for you to feed on the word and live the victory of the word. Yeah. But if we feed and we put the wrong ingredient in our faith engine, our word of God engine, it's like putting diesel in a gasoline engine. It's going to tear it up. You're going to get the wrong response, right? He said, don't take those thoughts. Don't take them. And then notice what he said in verse 31. Therefore, take no thought saying. Oh, he just told us how we take it. This is how you own thoughts. This is how you bring thoughts into your possession and you make them yours. Now it's no longer the enemy's thought that he's presenting, but now you have accepted it as yours because you have said, what am I going to do? How am I going to make it? What, what am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? Where am I? Those are our questions. Those are questions that breed fear. Questions that breed doubt. He said, don't take them with your verbal authorization. Don't take them by saying. Well, what did he tell us we need to be saying? He said, meditate. Don't let the word depart from your mouth. So we are supposed to have the word of God in our mouth. And when we do, we're owning it. We're bringing it in our possession. Now, 1 Peter 2.24, you might have a 1 Peter 2.24 in your heart, but I've got one that's mine. Uh, 1 Peter 2, I have 1 Peter 2.24 and it's mine. Oh, you have one too? You have 1 Peter 2.24 in your heart too? Then we both have one, but mine is mine. And it's feeding me. It's feeding my body. It's dispersing health to my organs. Amen? Why? Because I have brought it into possession in my life. And now it is, I have taken 1 Peter 2, 24, which is a thought of God, and I've made it mine. Amen? How did I do it? I spoke it. I spoke it. I, I brought it into my possession by not speaking and telling somebody else about it. I'll do that too. But for me to make it mine, I opened my mouth and I said, 1 Peter 2, 24 governs my body. My body is called into the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's got to perform the way I need it to perform so that I can do all that God's called me to do. So I take 1 Peter 2, 24. So the book of Proverbs says the power of death and life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And in the original language, the word power is the word hand. Death and life are in the hand of the tongue. And those who love it will eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the hand. What are you taking with your hand? Your spiritual hand. This is how you take 1 Peter 2.24 into possession in your life. This is how you own it. This is how you possess it. This is how you hold it in your life. If it's in your mouth, it's in your possession. If it's not in your mouth, if it's escaped from your mouth, you might not have a good grip on it. And is it possible to lose your grip on spiritual things? Well, he said in Hebrews, he said, we must 
give more earnest heed. Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we must give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, to the things, earnest heed to things we've heard. Well, we've heard it. We've heard it. But he said, you've got to go back and give attention to it because having heard isn't faith. You've used the faith that came from having heard. Faith comes by hearing. He said, we've got to give more earnest heed, lest at any time we let them slide away from us, slip. So do you see why Proverbs 4 is so vital? Attend, attend. Attend to my words. Attend to my words. Attend. Attend. Why? Because the enemy's trying to use circumstances and situations and, and difficulties to make you let go of what you once knew. Did, did John the Baptist say that the one who sent him to baptize in water told him, when you see the Spirit of God descend and remain on, on a certain person, you'll know he's the one. You'll know he's the Christ, the Messiah. Did, did John the Baptist testify and say, the one who sent me told me, upon whom I see the Spirit of God descend. And he said, today I publicly declare Jesus is the one that the Spirit of God, he he openly, publicly testified that Jesus was the one upon whom the Spirit of God descended and remained upon him. But we see him a few chapters later sending his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one? Oh, help me. Help me. God told him specifically. He had revelation that came from God. He saw in the Spirit, the Spirit of God descending upon Jesus. It was a supernatural revealing to him, and he lost it because of offense. Remember, Jesus responded to him and said, Go tell John, the blind see, the poor having the gospel preached to them, the lame are walking, tell him that the works of the Christ are being done in this ministry and also tell him, blessed is he who is not offended in me. So in that offense, he lost what he once knew. And that's why God says that we've got to give the more earnest heed because the enemy will try to bring situations and circumstances and difficulties and adversities to make us lose what we once saw. We don't have to lose any of it, though. Amen. We don't have to lose any light. We don't have to let circumstances change our belief structure. The Word of God can be such a stronghold in our life that no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, no matter what the enemy may bring, we shall not be moved. Amen. We shall not be moved. That's possible. That's what he said, the tree planted by the river of living water is a, is a person who is not moved by outward circumstances. No matter how hot it is, they still have water for their leaf system. No matter how difficult it is, they have a root system in the Word of God. I shall not be moved. I am the tree planted by the river of water. And that means I've got my roots in the Word. Amen. So he says here that we are uh, to refuse thoughts and then we are to redirect our thoughts to the provision of God or to the promise of God and that we should identify that if I verbalize it, I'm authorizing it. If I say it, and I, 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 I again want to encourage us, it's not just about a positive confession. This is not just about, oh, i got to say the right thing, and this is so hard to say the right thing. No, my words have power. I believe that the things which I speak, will, that I will have what I say. I believe that. Do you believe you will have what you say? You can't work Mark eleven twenty three 23 if you don't. He said you have to believe that you have what you say. And if you believe you have what you say, you won't say things you don't want to be in your life. <laughs> you are recognizing that I can authorize it or I can resist it. 
I can authorize it with my mouth. I can take possession of it. I can, I can bring it into my possession with my mouth. I, my mouth is like a hand that reaches and takes into my life or receives into my life these truths of God. So do you remember how in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Deuteronomy chapter 30, do you remember how God used this phrase in verse 19? I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I recall heaven and earth to record or to record what he had said was the blessing and the cursing. What he had said was specific instruction for obeying his word. And, th and then he said... I'm calling heaven and earth to record what I've said so that you will be able, you will know God told us what to do and heaven and earth will testify because it's on record what God said. It's on record. Do you know that the things you and I say is on record? Yes. It's on record what we say. Yes. Our words... are recorded. I mean, you just think Alexa hears you. God's got your words on record. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And this is for our good if we have a stronghold of the word. Amen? Matthew 12, verse 36 and I will ask for this in the Amplified. He said, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they will give account thereof in the day of judgment. Ooh. Every idle word. The Amplified says every idle, inoperative, non-working word. Every idle, inoperative, non-working word. And then he says, for by your words, you shall be justified, deemed right. By your words, you'll be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Well, this isn't necessarily talking about the believer speaking negative things and being condemned to hell. It's saying you will be proven wrong if you stand before God and say, God, you never did this for me. You never came through. I was believing you. And then he presses play on that recorder and all the doubt that you spoke about that situation and you said, I can never get ahead. And I got too much month at the end of the money. And every time I try to take one step forward, I get pushed two steps back. And God just plays that recorder and says, that's why. It wasn't my lack of providing for you. It was your words that were hindering you. By your words, you'll be justified, or by your words, you'll be condemned. Well, if our words are being kept on record, and we are going to have to account or explain or stand for what we have said... We need to be speaking in line with the Word of God. Hebrews 4 identifies for us part of the job description of Jesus as our high priest. Do you ever wonder what is Jesus doing? He's our high priest. And what is the high priest in the New Testament receiving from us? What is he receiving? It says here in Hebrews 4 and verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. What does him being high priest have to do with our words? This word profession is a word that means confession. It is the word homologia. And it means, it's from two words, homos, which means same, and lego, which means to speak. So when you put these two words together, it means 
saying the same thing. Let us, since we have a great high priest, let's hold fast. Let's be diligent. Let's get a grip on this saying the same thing. Hallelujah. Saying the same thing that he says about our life. Speaking about our life in line with what the word has said about our life. Accepting, this is what we're talking about in developing a stronghold of the word. Developing a, and establishing a stronghold of health. A, we got to say the same thing he says about our health. A stronghold of freedom. We've got to say what he says about it. A stronghold of prosperity. We've got to say what God says about it because Jesus is our high priest and the words that we say, he's receiving them. He's receiving them. When you say, I accept Jesus as my Lord, well, that's on record. The enemy can't come and say, Ivy's not saved because it's on record. God can press play and he can replay the day and the, the uh, verbiage of how Ivy gave her life to Jesus Christ. He says, I've got it on record. She has confessed Jesus as her Lord. Amen. Amen. It's on record. And so when we did that, Jesus received our words of faith. Jesus received our declaration of faith. And in that receiving, he established it with God. So when you read Psalm 91, anybody ever read Psalm 91 and thought, wait a minute, it just sounded like it changed verbiage here. Psalm 91 starts out saying, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord... He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. But then the next verse, it's not me talking anymore. It's verse 3, switched voice. Why? Because I made a declaration that my high priest accepted, and now he's telling me what's going to happen because of what I said. Surely he shall deliver you. Well, the I was me in verse 2. I will say of the Lord, and because of what I said, because of my confession of faith, I'm holding fast to that confession of faith. Jesus said, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence. And he begins to talk about all of the protection. He'll cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you'll trust. He goes through all of this pr protection and then it changes voice again. And God the Father says, because you have put your love on me, because you have set your love on me, therefore shall I deliver you. So we see the activity of a high priest in that we see that when we make a declaration of faith, Jesus accepts it. If we're making declarations of doubt, he can't work with it. He can't, he can't uh, bring his help to declarations uh, that don't agree with his word. It, it limits and hinders. Remember he said in Malachi chapter 3, your words have been stout against me. If we're speaking words that are contrary to his, then God is limited in our situation. He loves us and he wants to. He, his desire is to help us, but he cannot work against, because you've got the authorization. You and I, we are the verbal authorization. So if, if we want God's help, we've got to open up our mouth and agree with him and say, he is my refuge. My God and him do I trust. Surely. Hallelujah. And then God is able to receive that. Jesus, our high priest, hold fast. Why does he tell us, hold fast our confession? Because in the middle of a difficult situation, it's, it, it's the nature of, a, it's the desire of your flesh to talk in line with the situation, to speak in line with the adversity, to say, gloom, despair, and agony. How am I ever going to make it? No, no, open up your mouth, and in the midst of that adversity, begin to declare, I, I believe to receive the goodness of the Lord. God is my refuge. I trust in Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the plan of God for us. Hello, everyone. We are so excited about what God's doing in your life and in the ministry of Faith Builders. Michelle and I wanted to take a moment today and talk to you about 
partnership. And I know there's a lot of talk about partnering with ministries and uh, that word partnership is used a lot, but it's a spiritual principle. Yes. And I want you to look in the book of Philippians chapter four. Uh, very often we go right to verse 19, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. But it starts back in verse 15. And Paul says, now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. The word communicated in the Greek means to give or to share in all good things. The Amplified uses the term, no, no church opened up a credit and debit account with me or with this ministry except you. Yes. So Paul says that this church at Philippi entered into a giving and receiving relationship with him. As they gave into his ministry, they received. Now, the easy thing to look and see there is that that's financial. But the aspect of it is there's a spiritual connotation as well. When you get involved in partnering with a ministry and you open up that credit and debit account, he says God will supply all of your need yes. according to his riches in glory, his riches of anointing, his riches of glory, his riches of spiritual victory, and his riches of physical finances. I want to encourage you today, if you've not yet partnered with us, I want to encourage you to do so because the blessing of the Lord will begin to function in your life in unprecedented man ways because you enter into this account with us as we spread the gospel. God bless you. Thank you for your partnership. We have many ways that you can connect with us through your generous giving or prayers. Not only will your seed into this ministry help spread the gospel, it will produce a harvest in your own life. You can sow online, by mail, or by phone. Thank you for your faithful partnership. This is Pastor Philip Steele, and I want to invite you out to Little Rock's new Word of Faith Church, Faith Builders Church, right here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Our address is 10500 Markham. We have services Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday nights at 6 p.m., and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., our hour of power. If you're hungry for the moving of the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of healing, the working of miracles, if you're hungry for the moving of the Holy Ghost, then we're the church for you. We value the Word of God and believe that the Word of God is the answer to all of your problems. We have a whole slate of services that are available for your family. We have nursery ministry, children's ministry, and youth ministry, all geared towards building your faith and framing your world by the Word of God. I'd really love to see you. Come and see us. And until then, God bless you.